Thank you. Good day, everyone. My name is Joanne Singh, Veterinary Officer, Poultry Surveillance Unit, Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Uh, welcome once again to our live Facebook sessions. And today I am going to be talking about duck rearing in Trinidad. Thank you. So a lot of people are familiar with ducks because they know what they look like. And I am sure that most people would have tasted duck in Trinidad especially. Um, they are locally reared for meat. They are members of domestic poultry. They are easily adaptable to the environment and they are very hardy creatures as compared to the other species of birds or fowl or chickens that we may have in Trinidad. There are, there are lot, lots of breeds of ducks worldwide, but I'm just going to touch on just these four because these are the ones that are probably most familiar to the Caribbean and to Trinidad. So the Muscovy is one of the largest in North America, but it's found in our local settings. And that is, as you can see, the picture number one um, that shows the Muscovy breed. Then we have a Pekin duck, which is a white, all white, with a nice bright orange bill. The mullard is one that is becoming very popular locally, and it is really a cross between the Muscovy and another breed. Most times they cross the Muscovy with the Pekin and you get the mullard. It is a large duck and it grows rapidly compared to the purebreds. And this mullard here is just one that I threw in here because it's these colorful ones that you can see in lakes and ponds when you visit North America and so. So I just brought, put, put this one here to show you that we also have pretty colored uh, feathering on these animals. So locally, we have basically two, two systems. We either have a backyard type system, which is basically literally in the backyard, and it consists consists basically of some sort of water source where the ducks can have access to water like any pictures and also um, they are probably in an enclosed area where they cannot wander off too much and maybe a very meager sheltered area if any at all. Then there's also a semi-intensive where there is a covered area as well and an outdoor area. So you have the best of both and the ducks could either be outside or inside. This is just a picture showing an intensive part of um, production in Trinidad where all these ducks here have been kept in, in a pen and is enclosed and there's a concrete or maybe concrete slash dirt floor and a water source. So how do you get started if you want to grow ducks? Well, first of all, you have to know how to source your ducklings because you have to get birds to begin with. And there are four major channels that you could go through in Trinidad. You could either purchase breeders from local farmers and breed your own, your own ducks to produce your own fertile eggs and hatch them. So you get your own ducklings. Or you can purchase ducklings from local farmers that already hatched out. Another option is that you can import your ducklings from a source abroad, or you could in import hatching eggs and incubate them locally when they arrive. So either one of these you can explore. So if you are choosing to breed your ducks, you can choose your breeding stock from a local farm, and you're looking at birds that are five to eight weeks old, so that is the age group you want to choose your flock from, your, your breeders from. And you are looking at a record of the flock that, that produces 15 to 20 eggs per laying cycle in that flock. So you, you have to probably choose a reputable source in that they have good records and good reputation, right? So your target body weight for your breeders, your drake, which is the male, at six weeks old, you're looking at a target weight of 2.5 kgs or five and a half pounds. And when it gets to eight weeks old, 3.4, this is supposed to be kilograms here, and 7.5 pounds. For the hen, which is the duck, which is the female, 
you're looking at a little slight a slightly lower body weight same 2.5 kgs at, at six weeks old but 3.2 at eight weeks old because it's a smaller bit and some considerations that you give when you are looking at your your breeders when you're choosing out your breeders you're looking at their general appearance and make sure that um these birds look healthy and they are behaving in a normal way and they have a lively gait good appetite and the bright alert responsive all of these things will count when you are choosing your birds for breeding right so basically when you if you start in a small you are looking at one meal for five every five feet so if you want to start off with the minimum you just take one meal and you put them with five put him with five females the smaller breeds if you have smaller breeds that you want to look at one meal for 10 females so you could start off small and then you can grow from there All right so you're keeping your breeders separate until they're around six months old and you're looking for signs of sexual maturity um head bobbing nodding can be signs of sexual maturity um and in the meantime you are preparing an area or a breeding house uh you need a clean pond that enhances mating behavior and you need a sloped concrete floor for good drainage mating really begins between six or seven months old depending on how well they mature right so the laying cycle comes after well after they breed and mate laying begins between six to eight months old so basically the fertile eggs are laid approximately three weeks after the mating starts so looking at that cycle you will see that the laying consists of about three weeks and then they will set for about five weeks they have a rest period for three weeks they mold for 10 to 12 weeks and then they they start back laying again and this is the cycle cons consistent of 20 to 24 weeks right so um you're looking at trying to get 15 to 20 fertile eggs per laying cycle per breed and you um have to be observing your flock for abnormal behavior or for health problems every single day so you can get rid of any problems in its early stages so based on the cycle now you can get three hatches per year right based on the laying cycle so laying you need to provide nest boxes for your birds to lay and suggested dimensions for trinidad conditions you get 14 inches by 14 inches by 12 inches for one nest box so that is what you're measuring out to build your nest boxes and you can use wood material i have seen some people use discarded tires where they actually cut the tire to fit maybe to fit the bird and they just embed it down in the ground and it, it creates a nice nest and it works for some people so it all depends on what you have at your disposal and you can use them to make nest boxes what's important is that your nest boxes must contain clean dry bedding to make a nest right so you can use wood shavings so dry straw grass and your nest boxes should be placed in an area where it's away from drafts rain sunlight so in a shaded area must be clean at all times so you have to check them daily and make sure it's clean right so now you can do natural setting or incubation with a broody duck which is which means that a broody dog you, you are you basically looking at your females and you're looking for certain signs to determine broodiness the ducks are aggressive compared to the normal demeanor they're very active they hiss they have a hissing sound they run very widely around and they shed the down feathers which is the soft feathers and on the and the underside of the wings so that um you see the down is usually usually used to make the nest more comfortable so you see that behavior and you determine well okay that duck is a broody duck so she will set on the eggs properly all right so your natural method is really using a broody duck to hatch your eggs basically what you do you collect in your eggs in a sanitary manner until the duck becomes broody so you can store them 
at room temperature, right, um, for seven to ten days prior to incubation. So you can see them increase with the pointy end downwards, and when duck is broody, after the seven to ten days period, then you place the eggs in the net box, and um, the, the, the hen, the, the duck will sit on these eggs. Another option people do is just leave it naturally, and the duck lays her eggs, and she sets on them in a natural manner. Whatever works for you, that's fine. Right, so this is just a table here showing the breed and the incubation period or the period of time taken for these eggs to be incubated and in order to hatch. Right. This is just some pictures showing um some dots actually nesting and they are actually setting on the eggs and they seem to be very comfortable and happy. There's also another option, artificial incubation, where you can purchase an incubator, like the one in the picture here. There are many different types, designs, sizes, everything. So it depends on what you want to do and how large your operation is going to be. And it is essentially a box that with trays to hold the eggs. So this incubator creates all the right conditions for setting or incubating your eggs. The only thing is that you may have to turn these eggs manually if it's not automatically done. So it's another option that you can explore. So after incubation, all eggs should hatch within 12 hours of the first one. And in case of incubators, you may need to assist the weak dolphins by chipping the rounded egg, end of the egg. But that is only if necessary. Most of them do it themselves and they come out nice and healthy. So after hatching, what you can do is you replace your old bedding material in the nest boxes with fresh clean litter so that you get rid of all the debris from the eggs and the eggshells and all that. And you can leave your ducklings in there to nest for two weeks if possible. Alternatively, some people move their ducklings uh, earlier so that you have a shorter interval between the laying cycle. It all depends on your system and what are you looking to do, right? So this is just a picture showing what a brooding coop could look like. Uh, it could take many shapes, form, sizes, but you have to look at basic necessities that must be present. So you have a heat source, a feeder, a waterer, and your brooding period basically is from zero to five weeks, but it does not have to stay in the same conditions for that time. For instance, uh, zero to one, one week old ducklings, you have four ducklings can stay in a square foot area. When they are between one to four weeks, up to four weeks, you might have to expand that area to accommodate just two of them. And the more than four weeks, you just have like one duckling per square foot. So that is the stock density you're looking at for rearing your ducklings. So you must have adequate space. Your duck starter rations are commercially available in Trinidad, so you can look at that for, zero, for one to five weeks old. Um, you must have a high protein content. The feed is on a crumble form because of how small the, the birds are. Uh, you can give a vitamin mineral supplement, and you must have clean potable water at all times. It's very, very important that ducks are fed clean water. I have gone through this section here in my past presentations, but I will just make mention of it again. When you are brooding your ducklings, you're looking for the same signs that I explained earlier in a previous presentation. Um, behavior of the ducklings will tell you whether the brooding poop is either too cold where they are huddling, too hot if they are scattering like this. Uh, if it's drafty and there's a draft coming in, they will tend towards uh, area away from the draft, or if it's comfortable, everybody is uniformly positioned. So you have no problems here. So same principles apply to the ducks as well as the chicks. This is just a picture showing you some brooding. And as you can see, what I wanted to point out in this is that this is a raised floor of the ground, and there's a metal mesh coated probably wire mesh so that all the droppings and everything will fall under and there's a concrete floor at the bottom so it's very easy to clean and this is just one system 
that you can consider if you want to do your brooding. This is just showing that these ducts here are still being brewed in this brooding pen right here, and then they are transferred to a bigger area when they are fattening. So from the brooding stage, you move into fattening. Your brooding is zero to five weeks, and then your fattening is from five to 12 weeks. So your entire growth takes 12 weeks to get blocks to your market rate. Sounds very exciting. So what do you do when you're fattening? Okay, so as I said before, you can have a semi-intensive or, or intensive uh, system. Semi-intensive is when you have your covered shed area or you have a floor, uh, a sloped concrete floor that can wash down or a deep litter system. It all depends on what's your preference. And you also have an outdoor or forage area where they can graze grass and other forages. A pond is optional. Uh, you don't need a pond really, but you need to have clean drinking water. And you have, of course, you have to adopt your biosecurity principles, which is one of the first presentations I did previously. Right? Um, the intensive is where you have a totally covered, confined space. And the pen has litter, deep litter, or they, you, could, you could use a cage system, or you can use a floor system with a concrete floor, but they are all confined in that area. No foraging is in this system. So all feed and water must be supplied. And of course, your biosecurity principles are important here as well. How do you feed? Well, you in the fattening ration or the growing ration, your protein is decreased as compared to the brooding, but it must be balanced. And those details about balance and nutrients can take up a whole presentation. So I will be going into it now but you can always call at the end of it and find out if you need further information on that, right? But there are commercial dark rural rations available locally, which are very good. And your feed is, is in the form of a mash and it can be fed wet or soaked, but it should be consumed within 12 hours of when you put it down for them. Supplemental feeding is encouraged because ducks are very hardy and they like to forage and they get a whole host of other nutrients from these supplemental feeds, which is only beneficial to them. There are nutritional problems that you can encounter if you don't feed properly. So in a protein deficiency uh, diet, you will see a compromised growth rate. You will see a drop in egg production. You might see smaller eggs. You will see poor feathering. Energy deficiency, you would see them trying to take in more feed because they have been deficient in the energy on a reduced growth rate. Generally, if you have malnutrition for whatever reason, for different minerals, vitamins, protein, energy, all of these signs here will indicate that you have something going on with the nutrition. So you need to address that, right? Uh, so this is just showing some supplemental sources that you could add to your ration. If you can get these um, byproducts, in local in the local setting then you can add it to your your normal commercial ration and it will just boost or enhance the productivity because it will just add nutrients to these um diets you have to remember that when you feed in your dogs ensure that all feeds are fresh clean and free from mold garbage and debris a lot of people think that they could throw anything on the ground and the dog will eat it they will eat it, but it will just cause problems. They are birds, they are creatures, they are animals, and they also need to be to, to be considered when you're feeding them with these kind of uh, byproducts that it must be fit for consumption. You can't just do anything to them. Some key points in feeding when you're feeding your ducks. Feed is your most expensive input. So your need to avoid wastage because that is your largest cost. So what you do is you select a reputable ration from a reputable company and then your supplements, right? You must, the feed must not be in wet or moldy bags because you can have a uh, problem with mold and uh, mycotoxins and fungus, right? And get your bird sick. Um, once you purchase your feed, you should use it out within your two weeks and then purchase clean, fresh ones. Uh, your water, you have to make sure it's always there. 
available. You store your feed in covered bins and you store it away from chemicals. And of course, again, I stress that biosecurity is important. Just some things to remember about ducks is that there are some toxic substances that can harm your ducks, and I've just listed a few here. But you have to make sure that you do not use feedstuff containing these or any toxic ingredients. And some of these things are found in other poultry feed that are not toxic to what they are made for. For instance, turkeys or chickens can have some of these other substances in the feed and it will do them no harm. But if you feed that to your ducks, then you can get detrimental results. So you have to be careful about what you're feeding them in terms of your commercial feed. Make sure it's one designed for ducks. I just wanted to mention here some possible duck diseases. Now, ducks are very hardy. They do not get sick often, but the, the, we still have to consider some of the diseases that you can encounter. Um, they are not very many, but they are still important. So, the uh, first one I'm, I went through here is a bacterial disease, Remerola anatopestifa, and it is a pasteurella species, and it is found in the environment, and it can affect your ducks in all age groups. Um, can enter the system by scratches, bruises, wounds, contamination of litter, feed water, fecal contamination, all of these uh, things can contribute to them getting sick. So basically, you have to ensure that your environment is clean, right? The signs that you see when you have the disease is any one of these that I've listed here, weakness, neck, in, head or neck trauma, in coordination, dyspnea, which is respiratory problems, ocular nasal discharge, and a spike in mortality. So how do you fix that problem? Well, there are antibiotics available that can fight against the Remerella organism. Culture and sensitivity tests will be helpful in that you can do a sensitivity test via the lab and see which, which antibiotics will work against the, the organism. Right, so what you have to do is you have to depopulate your farm, basically, and you have to employ some proper hygiene, sanitation, biosecurity measures. Treat your environment before repopulating, and there's also a vaccine available for ducks, but uh, it all depends on what is available in Trinidad and what is recommended based on our disease history. So that will have to be consulted with. Another one is clostridial infection, sorry. Um, it is called botulism. And it is very is one of the most common things that we see with ducks in Trinidad. It happens right on the onset of the rainy season most times because the organism lives in the soil and it it is it proliferates through um anaerobic conditions. So when you have a little rainfall or flooding or anything like that, botulism. Uh, organism will proliferate and they can infect and affect your ducts in by producing a toxin and which affects the nervous system. So the ducts get some paralysis and you see the next next basically limp here and they can't sit upright so they get leg paralysis and maybe the wings as well drowsiness weakness and death. So how do you treat with this as well? Well, you remove the source of the toxin, which is probably the flooded area that you have, or water collecting somewhere, and it's stagnant, and it's dirty. So you have to remove that factor. You clean and you sanitize the area, and you create an area that will not be conducive to this organism, which is collecting of water and it being stagnant. And there's also antibiotic therapy, but in local settings, it may not apply too much because of the availability, number one, and also how many ducks you have to treat may not be conducive to doing it. Another problem that we see is called sticky eye, or it's really an infection of the eye, but it can be caused by bacteria. And in Trinidad, we have found when we look at that occurrence in Trinidad, we found that we we saw a pseudomonas species of bacteria found in the water. 
but there are also other bacteria that cause it. It'd be a whole host of other bacteria. But the thing about it is that Pseudomonas is one of the common causes. And that is because you have um, you have dirty water and you're using dirty water for drinking as well as they bathe in the water and all that. So if you have to make sure that your water quality is good. And, um, and that should take care of your problem. This other disease here, the viral enteritis, we do not see a lot of it, but it's also one that we have to, we cannot ignore because it may show up sometime. So it's uh, enteritis, and it is also caused again by contaminated drinking water, pond water or open water. So if you want to use pond water for anything, maybe you should consider treating your water before you use it. And it is um, also no treatment is available because this is a viral disease. Uh, your, your whole modus operandi with respect to this disease is to try to keep your water as clean as possible and employ your biosecurity measures. Of course, you're keeping wild dogs away as well from your flock because they may carry the virus and spread it. Dog viral hepatitis is another one as well, and it spreads the same way like the dog viral enteritis. It's just that you have some dif different signs here um, that you could differentiate, as well as postmortem and laboratory differentiation. So why ducks? This is a picture of me here trying to do some curry duck because everybody in Trinidad knew about curry duck and curry dog line. So I'm just putting this picture here to show that that is the basic culture factor here with ducks, right? So it's a protein source, it's tasty, it is in relatively high demand, doesn't have any religious taboos about it or anything like that. Everybody eats duck, <laughs> tradition, culture. Of course, everybody knows about a beach lime and a trinity river lime. Well, these days, backyard lime, curry dog competitions, they're easy to rear, they are hardy birds, your hatching slaughter is in 12 weeks, so why not? As I said, the ultimate goal is basically everybody knows about this. So it's a Trini River Lime um, staple in a lime. So thank you for listening, and I hope that this was beneficial to you. Of course, we also I also put our contact numbers here on our email so that you can send your concerns or questions or anything that you might want to contribute. Thank you very much. Okay, there's one question from Mr. Morris. What is a good vitamin supplement? Well, a good vitamin supplement, you can use something like poultry red cell or even hemoplex. You can get those locally. They are very, very, a very vast array of different supplements that you can get and they are very reputable so any one of those you look for in the agro shop if you are not sure you can always call us and we can give you an assessment so good luck with your doctoring thank you very much <laughs>